Welcome to Modern Latin America in 15 minutes. My name is Dr. Kim Richardson and today we're going to discuss the independence of Spanish America. There is so much information that it is impossible to do this in 15 minutes, but we will. We begin with not Spanish America at all, but with uh, uh, San Domingue, which is the French colony, which is today called Haiti. This is one of the richest colonies in the world at this time, a French colony, and it made them most of their money. But France, copying uh, the American Revolution, has a revolution of their own, and they begin to espouse things such as liberty, equality, and brotherliness, fraternity. As a result, uh, people begin to discuss how can we have slavery and brotherliness, liberty, equality, all at the same time, and it led to a very important slave uprising here. The slave uprising was the world's largest slave uprising beginning in 1791. Leadership was under Toussaint Louverture, and in this slave uprising, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, after he came to power, says, well, I would like to have a worldwide kingdom, worldwide empire, so I'm going to try to crush this uprising. He sent his troops under his son-in-law, brother-in-law, to uh, go down and crush this uprising. They failed miserably because they got yellow fever, dysentery. It was impossible. So as a result of this, not only did he give up on this attempt and give up on the Louisiana Territory as well, but the Haitians themselves declared independence in 1804. This is going to be important because it is the world's only slave uprising, period, and also because this becomes the second independent country in the Western Hemisphere. This historical event is going to have so many repercussions to come in the history of Latin America and the world that it is worth uh, uh, noting here. Back in Spain, however, going back to the Spanish-American er <coughs> uh, story, Charles IV was the king. His wife was Queen Maria Luisa, uh, and although they were married, they didn't really like each other all that much. Maria Luisa was having an affair with this person called Manuel de Godoy. Manuel de Godoy, rather than be executed, was named the uh, one of the pro uh, prime minister. And as such, he was not very good at it. He made a whole bunch of political blunders, which made uh, Spain a uh, laughingstock of Europe. Meanwhile, the son of Charles IV was Ferdinand VII, and he convinced his dad to abdicate. Well, according to him, his dad says he didn't, he says he did. They begin bickering back and forth until the emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte, says, why don't you come to France and we will solve this amicably. They go to France and they're thrown into prison. Uh, Charles IV soon goes to Italy, so it's just Ferdinand VII that can claim to be the legitimate king of Spain. Napoleon Bonaparte puts his brother, Joseph, on the throne of Spain. If you are living in Spain, however, do you support the new king, Joseph, or do you support the old king, Ferdinand VII, that is in prison in Bordeaux? Well, that leads to a civil war. A very bloody civil war in which they create juntas and they fight against each other. If you are confused in fighting a civil war in Spain, you might be confused in the Americas. In the Americas, do you support the one or the other? It begins in this story. It begins in Mexico, in which the viceroy, Jose de Irigare, decided uh, with the support of the Creoles, that he should perhaps create the junta here as well, just like they did in Spain, in order to support the king in exile, Fernando VII. However, the Creoles taking support means that the old rulers, the Peninsulares, are going to be ousted from power, so they are going to be very upset and lead a coup against Iturgare, put him in chains, and send him back to Spain. That means a new ruler, supported by the Peninsulares, is going to be Pedro Garabay. He's only going to be ruler for a, a viceroy for a short amount of time because he was very old. But it shows that the Peninsulares are willing to use force in order to keep the power that they have. This is going to lead to a uh, hatred between, of course they already hated each other, between the Peninsulares and the Creoles. The Junta was great in 1808 as we can see. Meanwhile, there is a guy by the name of Father Hidalgo. Father Hidalgo was a priest, and this priest was sent, because of a number of indiscretions, way up to this town of Dolores. Dolores, 
he was a Creole, and he's very upset, among other things, that the Penitulares are now taking over government once again at the expense of the Creoles. Of course, there's a little bit more to it than that. However, he decides that he and a bunch of people are going to lead an uprising to overthrow the Penitulares. Cat was uh, somehow uh, somebody told somebody, and uh, they sent the police, so to speak, after him to arrest him. And so he decided to begin the uprising earlier than he had planned. He goes to his church, rings the bells, and he shouts the Grito G. Dolores, or the beginning of the, his father Hidalgo's uprising, the Shout of Dolores. He is going to use this as a standard bearer, the Virgin of Guadalupe, used uh, during his uprising, 1810. And in this, he leads masses of indigenous peoples and anybody that would agree to follow him, First uh, a small group, then larger and larger pretty soon. Some sources claim there are 80,000 people following him on his way down to Mexico City. They get to the town of Guanajuato where they uh, massacre a group of Creoles and Peninsulares who are holding up in a public granary. They then go on to Mexico City but they stop outside, the, uh, outside of Mexico City giving the people in Mexico City, the troops, enough time to rally the forces and to scatter uh, Father Hidalgo and his, his uh, followers. And then he is eventually, after trying to escape north, captured, brought back down, defrocked, and executed. This is important because it marks the beginning of independence in Mexico. Even though, as you can see here, it says Mexico 2010. It's the uh, cent uh, bicentennial of independence, 200 years, but it's only the centennial of the revolution. They're two different things. He never said, I want independence. He's rising up because he's opposed to the Peninsulares. His cause is going to be taken up by Jose Maria Morelos, who is not a Creole, but who is a Mestizo. This marks a big difference between this uprising from Hidalgo to now Morelos. He will pretty soon argue independence. Uh, that is why Father Hidalgo's in 1810 marks the beginning of independence. Back in Spain, while this is going on, uh, they decided they're going to have to create a constitutional republic of sorts because they're going to want to create a constitution to rule in the name of Ferdinand VII, but he's not there, so they're going to have to rule by some sort of law. After all, so many people have been writing constitutions that Spain can do so as well. So they create a constitution, but it is super duper liberal. And so that's going to cause, in 1815, when the king for another seventh comes back to Spain, him to say, uh, whoa, I'm not liberal at all. What is going on? And he throws it out. And then he proceeds to amass troops to crush the independence movement. After a while, this independence movement uh, is going to, he's going to amass a great number of people under Rafael Riego to come to the Americas to crush the independence movement. Uh, that uh, we're about to talk more about. He refuses to do so, uh, and he instead marches against the king himself and forces him to adopt the liberal constitution of 1812 once again. That means that Spain is now liberal. Well, back in the Americas, uh, the, in all of the Americas, they're not fighting for liberalism. They're fighting well, Hidalgo and Morelos are fighting, but for the most part, people are not fighting, in, I mean, against the government. So they decide that they're going to have to declare independence if they want to keep things the same. And they do so. Uh, the, by this time, there's only something like 3,000 troops in rebellion. Uh, Morelos had been executed. You got Guadalupe Victoria, Vicente Guerrero. And the, the leader that's supposed to be crushing this independence movement, Iturbide, decides that rather than crush them, he's going to join forces with them. He creates an army of three guarantees in which, in this army, he is going to not declare uh, themselves in favor of uh, the new liberal constitution, but they're going to fight for independence and even ask the king if he wants to come back down to Mexico to rule in a conservative fashion. So right here what we have is an uprising to overthrow liberalism and declare independence not because they want a revolution, not because they want to change things, but because they want things to stay the same. So Iturbide is going to be credited with uh, actually getting independence with the treaty against the Spanish. He was able to defeat them pretty quickly. 
largely because of the Rafael Riego revolt. Meanwhile, you got Spanish South America in the next three minutes, and the Spanish America are also going to declare their independence. One of the key leaders of Northern South America is going to be Simon Bolivar, who indeed wanted to have some sort of uh, democratic type of government in the beginning, although he's going to later change his mind, argue that it's very difficult to have a revolution of any sort of independent period in the Americas. Simon Bolivar is going to attempt three different times, and finally the last time he's going to uh, get independence. So whereas in the north it was by no means revolutionary, in the south you could argue that at least in the northern part it was to begin with under Simon Bolivar, the leader of northern independence period, northern South American independence, it was uh, semi-revolutionary. Down in the south you're also going to have uprisings in this area is especially, this was the new vice royalty of Rio, uh, Rio de la Plata. And in this vice uh, area here, it was taken over actually by the British. Uh, the British, because they were fighting this war, the Napoleonic Wars, and the Spanish sided with the French. Uh, so the Creoles, the whites here, they're going to rise up in rebellion, not against the Spanish, but against the British overlords. And then after you have a taste of ruling yourselves, it becomes very difficult to uh, give it up. So they're just simply going to refuse to give it up. Uh, Chile is going to have an uprising in the West under the leadership uh, of, uh, right down here, Jose de San Martin. Uh, well, no, that wasn't in Chile, under the leadership of uh, uh, Bernardo O'Higgins, the son of the Viceroy. Uh, but uh, Jose de San Martin is going to come over to try to assist them, and together they're going to uh, defeat the last of the Spanish there. So this is the quickest overview that you've ever heard, but Spanish America, I wanted to emphasize, revolution is not synonymous with independence. They might get independence, but that does not mean that anything changes. That does not mean that they're going to overturn the system that they have. They're going to want to keep the conservative system. Certain characters are important. Hidalgo rose up, uh, opposed to the Peninsulares. Iturbe Iturbide, however, is going to be the one that gets independence for Mexico with his army, the Three Guarantees. In South America, there's lots of independent leaders, but the most important should be Simón Bolívar in northern South America. He, beginning 1808, began these movements for independence. Way down in the south, José de San Martín, a royalist, an army in the Spanish, uh, a soldier in the Spanish army, is going to come down to assist in. Uh, creating an army of the Andes and then coming up the west coast of South America. These characters are super important to understand that the independence of South America and Mexico are an uprising against Spain because they don't want change for the most part. There's always exceptions to every rule. And as they come to the Americas, not wanting, uh, as the revolution, the independence movement comes to the America, not wanting change, is going to lead to some messy, messy uprisings in which is a very bloody. Over 50,000 people are going to die. Some people would argue that that is such a small number that actually did die, right? But at conservative estimates, you got 50,000 deaths in this very violent Spanish-American independence. So keep that in mind as well. That is very violent here. Why is it violent? Because it's messy. It's messy because most people do not want... Uh, revolution or change, but there are a few people that indeed did, like Father Morelos, wanted to a degree change. Keep in mind as well, however, that even though they want change, they're not, because of the Enlightenment, the Iberian Enlightenment, they're not trying to overthrow the government necessarily, just to have independence so they can remain conservative, and especially, they are not trying to question religion. So all of these countries are going to have religion as a key aspect as they are created.